I'm Lauren Courtney, and I'll be talking about the paper, Hey You, Get Off My Cloud, about exploring information leakage in third-party compute clouds. First, I'll start with an introduction. Then I'll talk specifically about the cloud provider that was used for this paper's research, which is Amazon ZC2. And I'll give a brief demo of that for those of you that aren't familiar with the platform. Next, I'll talk about the two main topics that go with these types of attacks, placement and extraction. Finally, we'll talk about mitigation and then we'll conclude the presentation. So the primary goals of this paper are to explore the vulnerabilities caused by the expanded attack service of cloud computing. And the authors specify that this is more than just traditional exploits. We're talking about what new opportunities arise if adversaries can share the same physical hardware. So now these cloud computing users have to trust not only the cloud provider, but also other users in the cloud. And so your adversary could theoretically be assigned to the same physical hardware as you at the target. So the first step is to look at what vulnerabilities exist here. And then the second step is to determine the practicality of these attacks by other cloud users against their fellow users. And then third, we'll try to identify some mitigation strategies that can prevent against these attacks. Some key terms that we're going to want to keep in mind are the idea of multi-tenancy. And this is something you're probably all familiar with from previous modules, but we'll just go over it again. So this is the idea that the VMs of disjoint customers share the same physical hardware. And this is very common across cloud computing platforms. And along with this, we'll talk a lot about co-residency, and this just means that two users are co-resident on the same physical hardware. One of the main ideas of this paper is the idea of placement. So this is when the adversary arranges to place their malicious VM on the same physical machine as the target. And in order for the placement to occur, the adversary has to have a lot of knowledge about the cloud network and about the target instance. So we'll talk about how an adversary could start some kind of placement attack. In addition, we'll talk about extraction. So if the adversary is on the same physical VM, if the adversary is co-resonant with the target, how could they then extract confidential information from the target via a cross VM attack? And this is when we'll talk a little bit about covert channels, but mainly about side channel attacks. So for a lot of this presentation, I'll be using we to talk about us as the attacker. So let's get inside the mind of the attacker. Some of the primary questions the attacker has are, can we map out the internal cloud infrastructure? And if we have a map of the cloud infrastructure or what the authors are calling cloud cartography, then can we identify where an individual target VM is likely to reside within this infrastructure? And if we know where the target VM is, can we then instantiate a VM that's co-resonant with that target VM? And a sub-question that arises here is how do we even check for co-residency? So we'll have to talk about that as well. And then finally, if we're able to become co-resident, what methods can we use to extract target information? So it seems that there are a lot of steps to a successful side channel attack, and we'll go over each of them in detail. So the cloud provider that the authors of this paper used for their research is EC2, which is Amazon's Elastic Compute Cloud. They hypothesized that their research would generalize to other cloud providers. So this uses the Zen hypervisor. And the most important thing that we will need for this presentation is the idea that the Zen hypervisor has this privileged um, virtual machine, which is called Domain Zero. Um, this is responsible for routing packets from the user's instances, and it reports itself as a hop in a trace route, which is going to become really important. It does other things, but primarily think about it as routing packets. That's what we're going to talk about it in this context. When a user launches an instance, um, they get the chance to specify the region, the availability zone, and the instant type. Region is um, pretty standard, what you would think of as a region. Um, at the time of the paper's writing, there were only two regions, but now we'll look and there are many more. 
the availability zone means a separate failure mode. So this means there's separate power and network connectivity for each separate availability zone. And this is important if you have multiple instances running, you may want to put them on separate availability zones to ensure that your server, for instance, can remain up even if the infrastructure at the availability zone fails. And so when you think about availability zones, I think it's easiest to think about them as like separate sections of physical infrastructure. And then instant type tells you how much computational power or memory you'll get. So you can choose between, you can think of them almost as sizes. Obviously the more powerful you want, the more data you're going to need to process, um, the larger instance type you'll choose. Specific instances, once they're launched, are assigned to single physical machines. And these have external IPv4 addresses and domain names, as well as internal private addresses and domain names, which will be relevant. So I know for me, I was new to cloud computing when I started this class. Some of you are very familiar with it. If you're specifically familiar with EC2, you can probably skip over this section of the presentation, but I'm just going to give a brief demo of what happens when you launch an instance so that we can all be on the same page as far as what some of these terms mean. So here we are looking at my EC2 dashboard. I made a AWS account and so um, what's important here is you can see my region right now is Northern Virginia, but there are plenty of region options to change to. In addition, um, in the service health section, it states my region and then all of these zones. And these are the availability zones that I'm talking about. If I were to change my region to Oregon, let's say, you'll see these availability zones will change. Yep, so now they're different availability zones. So that's how those are tied to region. So if we want to launch a new instance, we're going to be able to choose an availability zone. So it's just as easy as clicking that button. Um, we'll just pick Red Hat for the sake of it. So this is where we pick our instance type. So as you can see, um, I'll use this free one, <laughs> T2 Micro. Um, the authors of the paper primarily used M1 Small, which I actually don't even think is still an option, or at least not for um, Red Hat. Instance type tells you, again, how much computational power and memory you'll get. So extra large instance types end up having an entire physical machine to themselves, whereas um, the smaller instance types are more likely to share hardware with other users. So most of the research in this paper is conducted on these smaller instance types. When we go to configure the instance details, we can now choose an availability zone. So there's a default, but it's possible for a user to choose what availability zone they want. So that'll be important when an adversary is trying to co-locate their VM with a target's VM. They'll be able to choose an instance type and availability zone to match that of the target. And then we would launch this VM. I already launched one to save us some time. But we can look at, oh, I gotta go back to my previous region, I apologize. So here we have an instance running and the important things here for networking at least, you can see we have a public IP, a public domain, and then similarly, we have a private IP and a private domain. And these are the main data points that are used in the research presented in this paper. So now we'll talk about placement. So this is the idea of an attacker forcing their VM to be placed on the same physical hardware as their target. So the first question that the attacker thinks about is can we map out the internal cloud infrastructure or do this idea of cloud cartography? And most of this is done with network probing techniques like trace routes from inside and outside the network. So the authors of the paper had two main data sets. The first was they launched a large group of their own instances um, and these had known availability zones and instance types so they were trying to figure out if the availability zones and instance types corresponded to different internal ip ranges and then the second thing is they took a large data set of external web servers and did a test to see if based on the data that they gathered could they then determine the availability zone and instance type of a target VM. And so this is um, the graphic that was provided. So the top one here 
is about availability zones. So as you can see, there's very clear distinctions between availability zones and IP address ranges. So just based on the internal IP address, it's very easy to determine availability zone. For the instance types, it's definitely not as clear, but the paper outlines five heuristics that allow them to predict instance type based on solely internal IP address and also this domain zero IP address, which manage, manages the instance. Knowing the domain zero IP address gives them some additional clues. And so essentially the researchers determined that you could figure out the availability zone and instance type of any um, target VM just from knowing their internal IP address. And if you know their external IP address, you can resolve that back to the internal IP address, which is something that um, they recommend the cloud providers obfuscate to make this a little bit more difficult for attackers to map out. So the second question, if we can determine where a particular target VM is located, yes, we can. If we know the availability zone and the instance type, we can we have a good guess at least of where it's located. And that information will help us make more educated and targeted guesses when we guesses when we try to co-locate with the target VM. So now the question becomes: can we instantiate our own VM that's co-resident with the target VM? And the first question that comes up here is how do we even know if we're co-resident? So there are three ways that we can attack this. The first would be to compare the instances domain zero IP addresses. So the way that the trace routes work, the very first hop when you send out a trace route will be your own domain zero IP address. And the very last hop before you reach your target will be the target's domain zero IP address. So it's very quick to figure out both your and your target's domain zero IP. And then if those are the same, there's a nearly zero false positive rate of the two VMs being co-resident. So that's a very quick, easy, and reliable way to determine if two VMs are co-resident. Um, the other two methods are to check for a short packet round trip time, which probably means they're on the same physical hardware, or to look for numerically close internal IPs. Those also have a high probability of being co-resident, but the way that the authors um, did most of their co-residency checking was with this first method of using the domain zero IP addresses. Another interesting question is, could you figure out if you're co-resident with a target VM without using any networking techniques? And this is something we'll come back to later, but the answer is yes. So we'll talk a little bit now about um, EC2's placement algorithm or how they place their VMs on physical machines when you launch an instance. This isn't actually known. It's just a educated guess on the part of the authors based on empirical evidence. So they noted that a single account never has two instances running on the same physical machine. So if you were to launch n number of instances, your instances would be running on n machines. And what was relevant for the authors, since they used the M1 small instances, is that there's a maximum of eight of these instances co-resident on any one physical machine. And once the physical machine is full, then no more instances are assigned to it, as you might imagine. There's also a bias in placement towards machines that have fewer instances assigned. And so this is thought primarily to help out with load balancing on the machines to make sure that no one machine is running heavy while other machines are running light. So there are two main types of placement locality that are going to be relevant when we're talking about trying to target um, a placement attack. So the first idea is of parallel placement. This is the idea that two VMs that are launched within a short time span of each other are more likely to be placed on the same physical machine. And the second idea, the one of sequential placement, is the idea that if you start and then terminate a VM and then shortly after launch another, um, those are very likely to have been on the same physical machine as well. So keeping these placement locality ideas in mind, we can come up with a more sophisticated placement attack. So there are two methods to try to guarantee co-residency. The first method is a brute force attack. This is where you have a very large target set. You take lots of instances 
that you make yourself and you try to match the availability zone and the instance type of your target um, VMs. And you launch many instances over a long period of time and then you perform co-residency checks to see how many of the targets you hit. And a very conservative estimate for this is that there's a minimum of 8%, 8.4% coverage of the target set. So this is really good for a very naive attack. That's still a considerable portion of the target set. And um, the authors observed that just a few small tweaks could make this attack much more efficient and reliable. The second method, which is a bit more targeted, is to abuse this idea of placement locality. So the idea is to try to get parallel placement. You want to launch your instances um, shortly after the target launches their instance. It's this idea of instance flooding. So you launch as many instances as you can at the same time and hope that one of them is co-resonant with the target VM. And while this seems like it might be hard to do, with cloud computing, users actually terminate and restart their VMs all the time to save money, so it's more effective than you might think. Um, one way to do this would be to monitor a server's state. When it goes down, you can expect that soon it may come back up again, so you could get ready with your instance flooding attack for that. You could also, if you have access to modify the load on a server, you could do something small like an FRC attack or something that will trigger auto scaling. Some servers have this where if they get a certain amount of traffic, they will just automatically instantiate a new VM. And so if you can force that to happen, then you as the attacker could know when the new VM was about to come online and then you could launch your VMs at the same time and hope that you would be co-resident. So there are a few ways to guarantee this. And this idea of abusing the placement locality is effective 40% of the time, which is very significant. So what we're saying here is that if an attacker wants to ensure co-residence with the target VM, they have a very good chance of being able to do that. Placement attacks are far more effective than you might think. So now the question becomes, if an attacker can place themselves in a good position, what kind of information can they extract and how? What methods can be used to get target information? And there are quite a lot of extraction methods that we're not going to talk about. Um, one of the primary ones is when you hear about side channel attacks, you may often hear about getting cryptographic keys in the same sentence as a side channel attack. But this idea is a bit more complex than what the researchers are going into. Additionally, they didn't spend a lot of time investigating covert channels, which is when um, an attacker and a target can send information between each other. This is a bit more of a collaborative kind of attack. And um, they didn't look into denials of service, which is when an attacker would be able to use up a lot of memory or put a big load on the CPU, which would prevent the target from being able to use their resources effectively. What the researchers did focus on was specifically some methods of side channel attacks. And specifically, they talked about how if attackers are able to measure the usage of CPU caches of the target using this prime trigger and probe technique, then this creates a side channel where the attacker is able to view the load measurements of the target. And when they're able to view the load measurements, this gives the attackers a few overt pieces of information that they may not have had through other avenues. The first of these is this idea of co-residence detection without networking. So if the attacker is able to cause load variation on a public facing web server, let's say, if you're able to force a lot of traffic to hit that web server, then you're going to force their CPU usage to increase. So those load measurements will increase. So if you have already had an open side channel on your VM and you're monitoring load usage, you can check for correlations between increases in load usage on your physical machine and increases in load usage that you're triggering on a target machine. So then you can use that to determine if the target that you're attacking or you know increasing traffic on is the one that's physically located on your machine. This is certainly not as efficient of a method to detect co-residency, but it is a way to do it without networking, so it is important. This would be available no matter how much obfuscation the cloud provider did to their internal networks. Another 
piece of information that attackers now have once they've opened this load measurement side channel is the ability to estimate traffic rates of a web server, for instance. Let's say one of the adversaries is a competitor of a target that they happen to share hardware with. And now they can check how much web traffic their target gets and at what times of day and learn maybe trade secrets or in information that the target would otherwise not want to release to the competitor. And the third type of information that the attacker can gain is a little bit more nuanced. And this is an idea of keystroke timing. So this um, in theory and in the researcher's work is if you have a system which is otherwise quiet except for typing in a console, then a spike in load corresponds with typing in a letter. And the time between these spikes in load would tell you in theory, the distance between the keys. And then this could give you information for a password recovery attack. You don't know exactly which keys they typed, but based on these distance metrics, you could figure out what patterns were typed, which would increase your ability to guess a password. This only works if A, the system is quiet enough that you can see these spikes, and B, if the attacker and victim share the same core, which only happens 25% of the time, even if they're located on the same physical hardware. So it's not as reliable. With more information about the target, it could be a feasible attack, but it is definitely not a guaranteed bounty of information just because the attacker has opened this side channel. So the, let's talk about some mitigation strategies that the researchers present. So if you want to stop the attacker from being able to do this cloud cartography, from being able to map out the IP space, then one way to do it would be to prevent these external IPs from resolving to internal IPs. If you don't know anything about the internal IP, then you don't know anything about what availability zone or instance type the target VM might have. Another idea would be to dynamically associate IPs with availability zones and instance types. Um, as the researchers showed, this is static, and you can see that very clear graph that indicates which availability zone each internal IP correlates with. If this was more dynamic or variable, then that wouldn't be available to attackers, but it would also be a lot more difficult for the cloud provider to manage. So if we're assuming that it's too hard to stop cloud cartography, maybe we can stop people from doing a co-residency check in general. If they don't know they're on the same physical hardware as their target, then they can't execute an attack in theory. So an easy way to do this would be to keep domain zero from responding in trace routes. If domain zero never responds, you can't match it with yourself and your target. However, we just showed that if you have the ability to look at load measurements on your um, physical hardware based from your instance, you may be able to determine co-residency with another instance. So that probably isn't the most effective place to stop this either. So what if you can stop placement attacks in general? Assume that the attacker has all the knowledge they need how can we stop them from becoming co-resident? And this is one of the key ideas of this paper. You offload the decision about this to the users. You give users the ability to say, I want all of the physical hardware associated with my instance to belong to me. I don't want anyone else to be able to be co-located or co-resident on my physical hardware. And obviously the users would have to pay for this ability but then if they choose not to pay for it, then that's their decision to take the risk on their shoulders and it takes the risk off of the cloud provider. If every user chose to do this, obviously it would take away a lot of the benefits of cloud computing for the providers as well, but it is a very effective way to keep adversaries from being able to do this kind of attack. If the adversary can't be co-resident with you, they can't open up a side channel. So it's a very viable option. But if that's not an option, how could we stop side channel attacks? One way would be to wipe these caches that are being used to check load measurements. And that, even if you do this, it's really difficult to know if you're stopping all side channels. We only talked about one, but there are many different methods that an adversary could use to create a side channel and gain information about other users on their same physical hardware. So really what the authors recommend, the best way to stop a side channel attack is to prevent co-resonance. And the best way to prevent co-resonance is to offload this choice to users. So that ends up being the suggested solution of the paper, one which I personally agree with. So in conclusion, 
Vulnerabilities certainly do exist if adversaries are co-resonant with targets. There are many types of side channel attacks and covert channel attacks and potential denials of service. There's a whole slew of vulnerabilities that occur when we have this sharing of resources. Some of these attacks are more practical than others, but it's far more practical than we would expect for a target to have an adversary co-resonant with them. It's much easier for the adversary to become co-resonant with a target than a target might like. And the best mitigation strategy for all of this is to put the opportunity cost on the users. If the user is willing to take on the risk of sharing physical hardware with a potential adversary, then that becomes the user's problem. And if they're not willing to take on that risk, they can pay for the difference. This concludes this presentation.